What's up, everybody, and welcome in to another edition of The Sit Down. As always, if you enjoy this video, please make sure you hit the like button and let me know what you think of today's very interesting discussion in the comment section below. If you're new around here, you just haven't done it yet, or you're living under a rock and seeing this video for the first time, I don't know what you're waiting for. Hit that subscribe button below now so you never miss another sit down video. Also, if on a Saturday you're looking for a great cigar, make sure you go check out our friends at Pravada Cigar Club. Get on the exclusive members list now and get the best the world of cigars has to offer. Pravada Cigar Club. Dot com. What's up, everybody? And we are back for another sit down short here on a Saturday. And in the mafia, we've all heard about the ruthless killers, Tommy Patera, Roy DeMeo. But what about several mafia killers maybe you haven't heard about? Today, we're going to get into three notorious individuals you probably don't know much on. The story of three reckless killers. Joe Meldish, Tony Plate Pilate, and Sally D. D'Ambrosio. Next on the sit down, I'm going to begin with a member of the Gambino crime family, the very vicious but mostly unknown Anthony Tony Plate Pilate. Now, Tony Plate was born in 1913 in the Bronx, New York. Now, he wouldn't last very long in the Bronx. Tony Plate by his late teens and early 20s, would head down to sunny Miami. And he would actually remain there for a lot of his mob career. I guess you could say Tony Plate enjoyed the sunshine. Now, he would still maintain his home in the Bronx. However, he'd begin getting into trouble down in the sunshine state. It was said that he would uh, be arrested for burglary uh, in the early 30s and was involved a lot in hijacking. Now, it was known throughout in Miami that Tony Plate was a vicious loan shark. Now, in the 40s, Tony Plate would head to prison on a robbery in New York. And by the early 1960s, he would be listed as a soldier in the Gambino crime family, according to Valachi information. Now, it can be garnered that Tony Plate was likely made in the 50s before the books were closed when it was still the Anastasia or Mangano crime families. Now, Tony Plate, as I said, was listed as a soldier. And it was rumored that early in the 60s or in the late 50s, he was in the crew of Armand Tommy Rava. It would ultimately be taken over, though, by Neil Delacroix. Now, for a lot of TP's life, he would be very close to Anelio Neil Delacroix and would ultimately be the reason uh, Neil Delacroix that TP uh, was uh, given the fate that he was given. Now, as I said, Tony Plate Pilate was a vicious individual. And as I said, spent a lot of time in Florida. He would not only uh, work out of various places, but the one that he was mostly known for was working out of the old Diplomat Hotel in Miami. Now, Tony Plate was, as I said, a vicious individual. And it wasn't just killing that he did. As I said, he would loan out money to various people, including businessmen in Florida. And according to one instance, at one point, he would loan money to a person called Sidney Carp. Now, Carp was the proprietor of an auto dealership called Hallandale Motors. And this is where Tony Plate was given the name The Pitbull. At one point, he would go to see Sidney Carp. He would leap on a Carp's desk and threaten to bite out chunks of his head neck, back, and arms. Tony Plate was a vicious individual, and I don't put it past him, quite frankly. Now, as I said, he would operate in Miami, and being in Miami, he would have to kick up to certain people. It was said that Tony Plate was particularly close to Santo Traficante. In fact, it has been stated through various newspapers, including the Miami Herald, that Tony Plate was involved in the construction rackets with Santo Traficante. Now, Tony Plate, as I said, did whack people on behalf of the Gambino crime family. And when someone needed killing for Neil Delacroix, he likely went to his friend, Tony Pilate. Now, in 1974, Tony Plate would take part allegedly in the murder of Charlie Bear Calise. Calise could be found in New York, shot five times 
in various parts of his body. Now, it has been reported that at one point there was a meeting held between Tony Plate, Neil Delacroach, and other members of different families to which they would discuss that Charlie Bear Calise uh, owed money to Tony Plate and was also said to be a mob informant. At one point, Delacroach would essentially say that can that be true about Calise, to which Tony Plate says it could be true. Neil Delacroach basically then tells uh, Tony Plate that you have to kill him. And Tony Plate responds with, quote, yes, I will kill him. I will kill him. Khalees would turn up days later, shot multiple times. Now, Tony Plate was also taking part in murders with the infamous Roy DeMeo. At one point uh, in the 70s, right around 1976, an electrical contractor called George Byram, who was based in Florida, was down in his luck. He was taking loans from all sorts of people, and he couldn't pay them back. He would also lead some sort of burglary crew or had information that he was giving to burglary crews, crews to burglarize homes in the Florida area. For some reason, George Byram decides to give the information of Nino Gaggi's vacation home to a burglary crew. Now, that was obviously bad information because we know Nino Gaggi was a reckless and depraved killer, but they went and burglarized the home instead. The problem is Nino Gaggi was present. They pistol with Nino Gaggi, and Gaggi got the drop on Byram. He would instruct Roy DeMeo to head down to Florida and link up with Tony Plate Pilate. Now, uh, George Byram um, was ultimately kind of brought to a hotel on behalf of some sort of business deal. And Tony Plate and Roy DeMeo got rid of George Byram. His body would be discovered by a maid. Now, I'm not going to go into the particulars of how uh, George Byram was killed. Um, unfortunately, on YouTube, uh, there's certain things that I cannot get into. Let's just say it involves certain things that Roy DeMeo was known for. Um, but unfortunately, they got spooked and had to leave and the body was caught kind of in the middle. So these guys were variously uh, depraved. Now, Tony Plate um, was at the main forefront of a lot of these murders. Ultimately, though, in 1979, not only Neil Delacroach, but Tony Plate are arrested uh, for the murder of Charlie Bear Calise. Now, I guess Neil Delacroach decided that it wasn't that he couldn't trust Plate, or maybe he could trust him. He just didn't want him around. So. He did what he had to do and allegedly had Tony Plate killed. Tony Plate Pilate would disappear in August of 1979. Now, according to most historians and uh, journalists, it was said that Neil Delacroach likely ordered Willie Boy Johnson, John Gotti, and Angelo Ruggiero to head down to Florida to take out Tony Plate. Now, it is rumored that after the disappearance of Tony Plate Pilate, days later at the Bergen Hunt and Fish Club, John Gotti, Willie Boy, and Angie Ruggiero all had, quote, healthy tans, which, again, we've always been asked the question, did John Gotti actually kill people? I have on three different scenarios that John Gotti likely either pulled the trigger or was present on up to three different murders. Now, I will say this about Tony Plate. He is regarded as one of those guys that you just didn't want to be mad at you. He was a vicious individual. And at one point, Neil Delacroach would say that he was, quote, terrifying. I will leave you with this. According to one employee at the Diplomat Hotel in Miami, he would say that Tony Plate was, quote, one of the nicest people he's ever met. So... He was one of those guys that on the surface was a very kind individual, but if he got him mad, he would likely take you out. And I relate this to another mob killer, Charlie, Charlie Moose Panarella. I did a video on him here. At one point in his golden years, in his 80s or 90s, Jackie DeRoss uh, would be at a meeting where Charlie Moose was at. And Charlie Moose was always regarded as very jovial as well. But at one point, Jackie DeRoss would be caught on wiretap saying, you know, Charlie Moose, he'd chop your fucking head off at 90 years old. And that's the kind of guy Moose Panarella was. And people like Tony Plate were. They were nice on the surface, but they'd have no problem shooting you in the head.
The next person we're going to get into is the very interesting Sally D'Ambrosio. Now, when we hear about the demented Colombo crime family, when we think of killers, we likely think of people like Sonny Franzese, Joe Waverly Case, you know, Dino Calabro. They've had some big killers over the years in this family. But one goes before a lot of them. And he actually has some very interesting connections to the film The Godfather. Salvatore D'Ambrosio was born in 1924, and he would grow up in South Brooklyn, like so many others in the early Colombo crime family. Now, Sally's brother, Funzi, would actually become a member of the Colombo crime family as well. Now, coming up, Sally D'Ambrosio was in the crew of longtime capo and huge loan shark, Nicholas Jiggs Forlano. Now, he was also said to be close, Sally D, with Carmine Jr. Persco. Now, the one thing that we can garner from Sally D'Ambrosio is he was very important in the Galli, gallo profaci wars in the early 60s. In fact, alongside Carmine Persico, and Carmine would get the name The Snake when he would go against the Gallo crew in favor of Profaci, we remember that Carmine manipulates the Gallos and supposedly attempts to strangle Larry Gallo. We, we've all heard about that story. It's said that the night Larry Gallo is strangled and ultimately survives, the person that strangles him was Sally D'Ambrosio, supposedly. So again, he didn't take out Larry, but he had no problem killing people on behalf of the Colombo crime family. He was very subservient to not only Carmine Persico, but the Colombo crime family. Now, one of the most notorious murders Sally D'Ambrosio is known for is the murder of his one-time friend, Joe, Joe Jelly Gioelli. I know that's a bit of a tongue twister. But during the Gallo Wars, uh, Giuelli was an enforcer for the Gallo crew. And he had a love for deep sea fishing, Persco side, Colombo side, Profaci side, once Giuelli dead. So he uses Sally D, his connection to Giuelli, and says, hey, why don't you come on on a boat and fish with me? We'll go deep sea fishing. It was said that... Uh, he was taken out and thrown into the ocean. Now, I bring this up due to the fact that it's a large piece of work for Sally D'Ambrosio, but it is also the basis behind the Godfather scene where they send a fish uh, signifying the death of Luca Brasi, which meant you know, Luca Brasi sleeps with the fishes. According to mob lore, it was said that when Joe Gioelli was killed, a dead fish was thrown on the doorstep of a Gallo social club. And that's where they got the idea for the Luca Brasi film part and the murder of him. Now, interestingly enough, Luca Brasi would actually be strangled, which we could also maybe take from the Larry Gallo situation. Sally D was a feared killer. At one point, it was said, and I'm going to say this, I'm going to wait on saying this, actually. At this point, Sally D's putting in work. He's ambitious. He's young. A lot of people fear him. And he is capable. He's connected with a rising Carmine Persico group. And at this point, Joe Colombo takes over and is the patriarch of the Colombo crime family. He, I think, views Sally D as a bit of a riser and decides that he wants Sally D killed. In 1969, Sally D'Ambrosio, at the age of 46, would disappear and was likely killed in a Bensoner's Brooklyn club. I will end it with this. According to Sonny Franzese, who knew Sally D very well, he would say in an early 2010 wiretap about Sally D, quote, he is one of the toughest motherfuckers to ever walk the streets of New York. When Carmine Persico when Sonny Frenzies are saying things like that about somebody, you have to figure they were one of the most ruthless people ever associated with the family. Sally D may not get the love due to the fact that he died in 1969,
but as he he was an absolutely depraved killer and very feared. When he says this stuff about you, this guy right here, you're the toughest motherfucker to ever walk the streets of New York. You probably are. The third individual we're going to get into today is not an Italian. He is a Catholic and his family is from said to be Lithuania. We're going to talk about Joseph Meldish, brother of Purple Gang leader, Michael Meldish. Now, you've likely heard Michael Meldish's name due to the fact that he ran the Purple Gang from really the late 70s on. But we're going to talk about his brother today because his brother is said to be one of the most ruthless people to ever walk the streets of the Bronx. It is said that Joe Meldish is a suspect or wanted or allegedly involved with between about 25 to 60 contract killings. Joe Meldish was born in May of 1956, and they hail the Meldishes from the Bronx. Now, Joe Meldish was the muscle behind not only the Purple Gang, but it was also involved in various other families in taking work for the mafia. Now, according to my friend Scott Deach, the author of The Mafia, Drugs, and the East Harlem Purple Gang, he would tell me that there were multiple unsolved or possible murders that Joseph Meldish was likely involved in. Now, it was said Joe Meldish committed his first murder by the age of 18. He would get three years in prison and be released in the early 80s. Now, one thing we would find is he wouldn't be arrested until, I believe, late 1976. According to Scott Deach, it was said that Joe Meldish was likely involved with multiple murders in the Purple Gang, as well as other murders on the street. It was said that in August of 1975, he would take part in the murder of a person called Frank Ciapetta in the Bronx, as well as the murder of a person called Joe Butch Messina. So he was taking contracts. He was doing hits with his brother, Michael Meldish, and he was putting in work. It was also said at one point, as well by Scott Deach, that supposedly Joe Meldish at one point was working directly for Joseph Pagano, a Genovese capo based out of the Bronx and Rockland County. So Joe Meldish was not only doing things on his own, he was protecting a drug trafficking organization. He was the muscle for a very feared group of people that had a very lucrative enterprise, but he was also doing things as a strong arm helper for mobsters. The problem, though, that Joseph Meldish had, unlike his brother, Michael Meldish, Michael Meldish was the, if two brothers in the drug trade are righteous in any way, Michael Meldish was the more like functional person. He was doing things on behalf of business. He wasn't doing things like take drugs, get addicted to drugs. And that was the issue for Joseph Meldish. Joseph Meldish was a essential junkie. Um, but I want to get back to 1981, really right after he's released for doing his first murder. It was said that Joe Meldish got into a fight at a Bronx social club with a person called John Gioa. Gioa would then throw a hand grenade at Meldish, which would not explode. Meldish would then take out a gun and shoot him in the head. Now, Joseph Meldish wouldn't face the fact on this murder because witnesses would not testify, and they were extremely feared of Joe Meldish. Now, in this case, against Gioa, he likely was in the right and defending himself. However, he had no issue killing people. And that's something that, as we've talked about time and time and time and time again, if you were able to do that, you will be very beneficial to drug trafficking organizations, mafia groups, organized crime. Not everybody has the ability to kill someone with no issue. Joseph Meldish absolutely did. Now, he was involved allegedly in various other crimes and murders. I've also heard stories that Joe Meldish would walk up to a corner boy in the Bronx and basically say, what do you got on you? And he'd rob him on the spot. Because again, he was a nickel and dime guy. He was doing big things, but money flew because he was addicted to narcotics. Now, at one point in the late 90s, Joseph Meldish was said to be 
a drug addict and he was hanging out with other undesirables as well as a drug addicted hooker called Kim Hanslick. Now at one point, Joe Meldish got into a beef with a person called Tommy Brown over drug money. Now, according to the authorities, Joe Meldish was given the location of Tommy Brown by Kim Hanslick. Joseph Meldish would stalk Tommy Brown to a bar called Frenchie's in the area of East Tremont Avenue and Meyer Street in the Bronx. It was said that Joseph Meldish walked into the bar that evening and shot Tommy Brown nine times as he sat at a table with his wife. Now, ultimately, Joseph Meldish would be rung up for this murder as well as other crimes. And he would have to face the tale that in the late 2000s, he would have to then go to prison for a long period of time. In the end, the driver that night that drove him to the bar to kill Tommy Brown would flip on not only Joe Meldish, but his girlfriend, Kim Hanslick. Kim Hanslick would get a 20 years to life prison sentence and is currently at Bedford Hills Correctional Center in New York. Joseph Meldish would also get a long prison sentence. In 2011, he'd be hit with 25 to life. His earliest release date, as far as parole eligibility, will be in 2032. And he will be 75 years old at that time. He currently sits at one of 16 maximum security prisons in New York, Eastern Correctional Center. Interestingly enough, not that far from his home area of the Bronx. Now, while in prison, his brother Michael would be stalked to the Throgneck section of the Bronx and shot multiple times by multiple assassins. It was said the assassins were sent on orders of Lucchese boss Matthew Matty Madonna, as well as Lucchese underboss Stephen Crea. Both Crea and Madonna are serving life sentences. However, in recent years, it has become more and more clear that they may someday get a new trial. I guess we'll have to wait and see. Joseph Meldish was a feared individual, and we don't know how many people he likely killed. My guess is it's probably north of 20 people. I don't know, and we never likely will know. He probably just killed for sport. And if you know anything about the Meldish-led Purple Gang by the late 70s, they were young, they were hungry, and they were killing people. So we don't know how many, but it's likely many. I wanted to delve into just a few people that I didn't want to do whole shows on because I think people enjoy these sorts of videos. It's not just Greg Scarpa and Tommy Patera and Roy DeMeo. There are others that were major killers in the mafia. What about you? Who would you include in a video like this? Tell me a killer in the mafia that we may have to do a show on at some point. Who is a killer that we don't hear much about? Drop them below in the comment section. We'll see you next week here on The Sit Down.